Over the last two weeks, we have been looking at the, the subject of spiritual gifts. And I, I believe in, it's probably the most important topic in relation to the church in the whole of the Bible. Now, I know that's a, a bold statement to make, but if, without this, we have no way in which we can function within the body of Christ. People search the scriptures for a blueprint on church structure and programming, and you can never find it. There is no set way in which church should operate. And we think, uh, we always think that we've got it right, and then you go to another church and say, they're doing something really fantastic, and they're quite different, and it, wow, this is, um, this is a different way of doing church. And some do it um, in, in liturgical ways, and, and structured ways, and some are less structured. But there's no, no blueprint for the way in which church should operate. I guess the most significant piece of infrastructure that we are given for the church has to do with elders and deacons. And they were only basically given their, uh, their characteristics with very little even said about their, their job. There isn't a clear job description written down for, for them. We, we can pull it together from pieces in 1 Timothy, Titus, perhaps Acts 6 with the deacons. But it's, there's still a lot left there for, for us to work through and to, to develop according to the needs and, and requirements and cultures that, that we have as churches. As we've looked at it, we've started to see that, that um, first of all, what spiritual gifts are and what they're not. They're tools to work with, and that's something which I really wanted, wanted to stress with us over these weeks, that they're not toys to play with, they're not gimmicky things, they're not stuff that we, we sort of pull out like our favourite toy and, and show off with, like children might when they get their, their toy and they're not going to share it with anybody, it's sort of like, this is mine. Um, they're, they're not toys to play with, and nor are they weapons to attack each other with. And as we mentioned last week, there's sadly a lot which has happened within the church around spiritual gifts which has been negative and has been used to, to pull each other down and to criticise people and to be uh, unfair against, against people. We also started to look at, and we've mentioned it every, every time, and I've got to mention it again, what's love got to do with it? Jesus made this, he gave us this new commandment. He said, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. It's not an option. And how do we show that love? We can show it as we start to work with each other and serve with each other and accept one another with this what the, what the scriptures would term as an agape love. It's an unconditional, sacrificial, self-giving love. It's not thinking about what is, what is in this for me, but always what is in this for the, other, for the other person. And if we're obedient to Jesus' command to love one another, then the spiritual gifts will operate at their optimal best when that is the, the, the framework in which they operate. We talked about it being the, the framework of the whole of the fruit of the Spirit. And so if, we, if we're serving well and we're serving with self-control, that's going to be a blessing to those we're serving with and those that we are serving as we think about our spiritual gifts. And so the, this is the framework. The spiritual gifts are the framework for which we can think about the way in which a church should operate. When we start looking at this topic, We've only been scratching the surface. But you could ask the, the question then, what sort of church, or what would the church look like if it was operating according to this New Testament structure, where teachers taught, leaders led, administrators administrate, givers give, mercy people show compassion and mercy, the helpers are helping and serving. If, if everybody was functioning according to their gift and finding out what their gift was and using that as the tool for service and for life and for growth within the church. In the network course, which is put out by the, the Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago, which is an excellent course for starting to understand the whole concept of spiritual gifts and how they function within the church, they have this uh, simple allegory. It said, once upon a time, right after creation, all the animals formed a school, established a well-rounded curriculum of swimming, running, climbing, and flying. All the animals were required to take all the courses. 
The duck excelled at swimming. In fact, he was better than the instructor. But he only made passing grades in climbing and was very poor in running. He was so slow he had to stay after school and practice running. This caused his webbed feet to become so badly worn he became only average in swimming. But average was quite acceptable, so no one worried about it except the duck. The rabbit was top of her class of running, but after a while she developed a twitch in her leg from all the time she spent in the water trying to improve her swimming. The squirrel was a peak performer climbing, but was constantly frustrated in flying class. His body became so worn from all the hard landings he did, he did not do too well in climbing, and ended up being pretty poor in running. The eagle was a continual problem student. She was severely disciplined for being a nonconformist. In climbing class, she would always beat everyone else to the top of the tree, but insisted on using her own way to get there. Each of the animals had a particular design. When they did what they were designed to do, they excelled. When they tried to operate outside their area of expertise, they were not nearly as effective. Can ducks run? Sure they can. Is that what they do best? No. Given the limited time each of us have, doesn't it make sense to serve where we are best equipped? Ducks can run and run hard, but they are slow and get tired quickly. People in ministry can be like that. Like a duck out of water, we can serve outside our area of giftedness. We can do it, but it is not what we do best. So when we think of the way in which a church is structured, the way in which a church forms, if we were to start to think about doing it around the whole structure of our giftedness, and people were able to operate in the area of their giftedness and with their passion, we would start to see the way in which a church was designed to grow and to, and to function. We put our gift into the area of our passions. What, what spins your wheels? What keeps you awake at night thinking, man, if I could do that, I would change the world? What would get you up in the morning to say, that's it, that keeps me alive, that keeps me going? See, whatever that passion is, God can use that passion and He can use that giftedness that He's given you to make that alive and to grow His kingdom. Paul said to his young protege, Timothy, this in 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Again, he, he, he brings this whole idea of Timothy. If you're going to practice and experience and grow your gift, it needs to be done in an atmosphere of love, of, of power, and of self-discipline. Timothy received his gift from Paul with the laying on of hands. And one of the questions that is continually asked is how do we receive our spiritual gifts? When do we receive them? People would say that we receive, because they're a spiritual gift, we would receive them at conversion. When you receive the Spirit, you receive all that He has given to you. And as we saw uh, last week, He can take the natural talents that are part of us, which may come to us through our genes. Uh, we often see it, for example, we, we talked about music last week, but if, if you look at musicians, there's often some form of music that can run through a family. It may be through the culture of the family, through the genes of the family. I don't know how that happens, but it can, can happen. And people in family lines can, can have a particular uh, tray that they carry in, in that area. And then the Spirit of God comes into that, and He empowers that, and He generates something new and fresh and dynamic in that when it is used for the purposes of extending His kingdom. And He changes all of that. I don't know very many people, in fact I don't know anybody that has had a specific apostolic laying on of hands to receive their gift. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I just don't know anybody for whom it has happened. I also believe that there are times when there could be, because we have received all we need to receive in Christ, that, that there is a, a sense in which there can be a latent gift that has never been released until we have put ourselves into a situation where that needs to blossom. We're going to talk a little bit about that in, in, in a moment as well. 
And so with all that we've said about gifts of the New Testament, the writers have never given to us a system where you could say, if you do this, 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 and this, the net outcome of that will be, you will know that this is your gift. And I reckon that's sad. That would have made it so much easier if they had said that. You know, if Paul, with all this writing that he did on spiritual gifts, had said to the Corinthians, now this is what you need to do. But he didn't need to do that because he's already told them in chapter 1 and verse 7 that they've got all the spiritual gifts that they need and they knew what they had. And there's always this assumption with what, uh, well, particularly what Paul has said in both Romans, Corinthians and, and Ephesians, that they will know what their gifts are. So he's not teaching them how to get there. Now, you know what it is, don't you? Well, for some of us, it's not quite as clear-cut as that. So I want to spend the rest of our time this morning just going over some, some, giving some practical help that I hope might enable us to know what our gift is so that then we can fan it into flame and make it really grow and glow and, and be a dynamic force within the life of the church. So why is it important to know your spiritual gift? Well, it enhances your sense of belonging. If you, are, if you know what your gift is and you are it is serving with that gift, you feel like you are part of the body. It's like my, like my arm. If, if my arm is severed, the nerve is severed at the, at, the, at the joint, it might be attached to my body. But it's useless because it's paralyzed. And it's, it's, it's more a nuisance because I've then got to do everything that I need with it because it does, does, its, own, does its own thing. But if we know what our gift is, it means that we can... We, we, we have the sense of, of ownership of what we're doing. It enables you to make a worthwhile contribution to the body of Christ. You know that this is, this is where you're going to make your contribution. And you know that it's going to be worthwhile because it's what God has gifted you to do. And it's going to be significant because it's going to be building up the body. One of the questions that plagues most Christians at some point in their life is, how do I know the will of God for my life? Well, a key to knowing the will of God for your life is to know what your spiritual gifts are. Because the will of God for you is going to revolve around what that gifting is. And most of us are more worried about am I to do this job or that job, am I to live here or there. And I don't believe God is as interested in where you are and what you do in terms of your job as he is in who you are as a person and that you understand your relationship to him and all that he's given you and wants you to do for him. And you can do that whether you're an accountant, a plumber, an electrician, a builder, a nurse, a doctor, or whatever. He says, I want you to do that, to do it for my glory, and to use the talents and gifts that I have given you for that. Are there some fundamental prerequisites, some basic things that we need to understand if we are going to understand what it is? And I believe that the first one is that we need to be surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. Mana has encouraged us to to seek and honour Him in our worship. And it's not just here as we sing some great songs together and we, we can become wrapped up in the, in the music and the, the, the lyrics, lyrics and we send out our praise to God for that. But when you're out there tomorrow morning in, in your workplace and in your home and, and wherever you are, Jesus is still Lord. And that's the whole thrust of Romans 12, 1 and 2 about having the renewing of our minds that we might be able to serve Him totally and completely. And then, of course, in Romans 3, then to 8, Paul is telling us about spiritual gifts. So he's almost saying, get your heart right, get your mind right with God, with Christ, being led by the Spirit, and then the spiritual gifts will have a clearer perspective. There needs to be a willingness to work. Now, I know this is, this is the hard part. Most of us are looking for a lifestyle free of work. But that's not going to happen as long as you are in the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58 says, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That work of the Lord is not just being a pastor or a minister or serving in some form of full-time Christian ministry. Giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord is giving yourself fully to Him as you work for Him wherever you are. Whatever that is, whatever the vocation. 
He's called you to. Give yourself fully to it as serving the Lord. And then have a teachable spirit. The navigators used to operate on the SPAT principle. Faithful, available, and teachable. If you want to be a full-on serving Christian, then you need to be fat. Faithful, available, and teachable. You can be faithful and teachable, but if you're not available, you're not going to do much. And you might be faithful and available, but you haven't got a teachable spirit. Nobody can teach you anything. You know it all. And so what's the point? You're not going to be as effective for God as He would want you to be. You might be available and teachable, but you're not faithful. You're here, there, and blown around by every bit of wind and doctrine and fancy, and, and sometimes you're, you're hot for God, and sometimes you're cold, and sometimes you're in church, and sometimes you couldn't care less, and, and, and you're not faithful. But a teachable spirit, a faithful, available, teachable person is going to be able to change a church community and its own community. So what are some steps to discovery? We're on fire for God. We're committed to His Lord, the Lordship of Christ. We want to work. We want to be teachable and all of those things. Well, first of all, we explore the possibilities. 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul made this statement right at the beginning to the church at Corinth. I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. I want you to have knowledge. I want you to have understanding. I want you to search this out. And I want you to know about it. So we study the biblical passages. We know what they are now, don't we? Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians, 1 Peter 4. Okay, so we've got those. So we go over them, we read them, we pray about them, we try and understand what, what Paul is in particular is trying to say in relation to them. Then we can read some good books about spiritual gifts. There are all sorts of books. Going back about 25 years, which is a lifetime ago, almost, um, might be 30 years, you could hardly find a, a, a book written on the subject. Now you can go into any Christian bookshop and they've got copious volumes of them. Some of them are good and worth reading, and some are just leave them sitting on the shelf. They'll, they'll do more good there than by, by taking them. But understand, read something, Listen to good podcasts. Listen to get, get some more instruction on it. And there are all sorts of good resources out there that can help you with that. Get to know gifted people. If you have a sense of, of where your gifting is and, and what, uh, what, what you think God wants you to do, find someone else who has that, that same gift but is a little bit further down the track than you. And you start talking to them and asking them questions about their spiritual gift. How did they discover it? What opportunities did they see to be able to, de to develop it? What would they say to me as I want to try and get started with this? What, what recommendations would they make? How would they, how would they encourage me to be able to expand that and to grow it and to develop it? And we talk to gifted people about it. We question them. We talk openly about spiritual gifts. Including with people who may have a different opinion to yours. Because you might, you might think that you've got a gift that somebody else thinks is, is probably not an appropriate one. Or they might not think it appropriate to you. Talk to them why. What is it about me that you think wouldn't work for that? Get, get a double perspective on it. And it will help you start to clarify what is God doing and how is He leading you with that. Then experiment with the gifts. Undertake this with an attitude of prayer. Identify needs around you. If you're starting to get a hunch as to where your, where your spiritual gift might, might, have, might lay or work, look for opportunities around that gift and say, how can, I, how can I get involved with that? Be available and apply yourself to it. If it's uh, to help Joe in the, in the children's ministry, think, I don't know whether I could be a leader or a helper, I don't, I don't know, but I'll, I'll tell her I'm available. And she says, great. I'll rock you on here. Then don't get up on Sunday morning and think, now what am I going to do with these kids today? On Sunday afternoon you start thinking about a week ahead and you say, how am I going to work with this tool? What would, I, what would be good to share with these children? What would be the best way to actually apply this? Into it? And so you work hard at it and you apply yourself to it so that when you get with the children on, on Sunday morning, 
you're equipped, you're prepared, you're ready to go, you've got it all sorted out, and, it's, and, and you, you're going to be so fired up with it. Of course, if you, if you do the other, of course you're not going to enjoy it. You're not going to see any results from it. You're going to walk away and say, I'm not gifted in this area. Well, you wouldn't. don't know because there was no application to the task. Also, as you look down the gifts, we, we talked about this, I think, at the very beginning. Ask yourself, which of these don't I have? You might say, I, I'm not an administrator. You want to just look at my whatever, my desk or my pantry or whatever, and say, uh, no, I'm not an administrator. I just drop stuff. Well, so you can cross that one off the list. Or, or a teacher. I'm not a teacher. I, I, not an official. I know I have to teach my children, I have to teach, but I, I couldn't be a teacher. I know, I've just never, I've, I've tried it, it just hasn't worked. And so you can eliminate some by just asking the question, what I don't have. Examine your feelings. We're often told not to rely on your feelings, and I'm, I would endorse that. Don't rely entirely on your feelings. But your feelings can also be an indicator as to whether or not there is a, a divine direction here. If you have a longing to do something, it could be a divinely placed longing in your heart. The, the Spirit of God has put it there so that you will move in that direction. It might be a sense of deep satisfaction and fulfillment when you've, when you've also done something and you've achieved something in it and think, wow, that was so cool. And you could you get, you get look for a week on, on that experience. It, was just, it just gave you a buzz and, and gave you a real high on that. On the converse side of that, a lack of desire or a, a, a lack of um, satisfaction out of doing something might also be an indicator that you're, you're not quite there, it's not quite you. Now if you go into a hospital ward, you know hospitals have this unique smell. I think they're getting better, but you, you go in and you think, you're going to, you're going to go and visit somebody because you think, okay, I want to try this gift thing, I want to see if I've got a gift of encouragement or compassion or something and, and, and so you go into the hospital ward and you get the smell hit you, Woo! that's not me, you know, that's, that smell just turns me off. So uh, and you go in and because you've got this going around in your mind right now, the, the person that you went to bless is more blessed when they see you walk out the door than they saw, than they saw you walk in. You know, it just didn't quite work. But your feelings can be an indicator, a sense of fulfillment, a sense of satisfaction and desire that you can have. Evaluate your effectiveness. I say this cautiously because having said that, the, the, the disclaimer for that is beware of a scorecard mentality. And there, are some, there are some gifts that are more prone to, to scorecards than perhaps others. But just don't look for results in what you're doing but, but don't be captivated by results. It's God who gets the glory out of anything that we do. And He will bless what we're doing. But don't take don't take pride in the results, probably what I'm trying to say in that. Let God get the glory from that. Gifted people will usually get results in what they do. And results can provide confirming and positive evidence of at least an initial potential to develop a particular gift. This to me is a key. <coughs> Expect confirmation from the rest of the body. When you start serving, the body will start to tell you You'll get the idea that this is, this is where it's all at. Gifted people receive more work in the area of their giftedness. Because people see what you've done and they get blessed by what you're doing and they say, hey, will you come along and do some more of that? Now, because you get satisfaction and fulfillment out of that, you're going to say, sure, when can I start? But when people ask you to do something that you're not gifted at, you feel out of, out of your depth then, and it's all, all uncomfortable for you, when they ask you to do it, you get that horrible sinking feeling down here somewhere and you go, oh, I've got to tell them no, but I don't know how. Your body will confirm it. And the confirming word is an encouraging word. And in fact, it safeguards both the individual and the church. When, the, when a person responds to the encouragement of the body and is asked to do more, it becomes a confirming, attributing blessing. You see, if you had a solo stand up and sing, and they sang most of the song off key. It would not be a good thing to go and tell that person that they did a really good job. You might find some other way of encouraging them. You might say, hey, that was very brave of you to do that. Um, 
you know, was you must have worked hard and overcome some fear or something to do that. But you don't tell them that they did a good job when you know that they haven't done a good job. In fact, you're embarrassed all the time they're going through the song. I know there are some, some uh, churches, and perhaps in the larger churches, if you want to be part of their worship team, you do an audition. And I've heard people say, that's terrible. You shouldn't have to do an audition. Why not? They are leading the church and blessing the church, and we don't want to be cringing because it's all off-key and feeling embarrassed for them. We want to be able to just rest in the fact that they're using a talent God has given them, they're lifting us into His presence, and it's great joy, and, and we're, we're just released from that. And so we aren't telling people to do that they're good at something that they're not. So what do we do when we think we're getting some indicators? Well, we can research them and, and look back over the definitions and, and what's um, the things which are already said. Ask, when you start to think about what you gift, ask yourself the question, how can I use this gift for the common good? Because that's what Paul said in Corinthians 12. He said, we have our gifts for the common good. If I can't use this gift for the common good of the body, then it's just probably not a spiritual gift for me. There needs to be that sense of you first. You are the ones that has to be, have to be blessed by this. Whose responsibility is it for you to discover your gift? In short, yours. It's your responsibility. God has gifted you. God has equipped you. And if you have a passion to serve Him, you have a passion to know how it is that He wants you to serve. If you don't have a desire, no one can help you discover your gift if you don't have a desire to want to know what it is. And then as you seek to develop your gift, as Ephesians 4, 11 to 16 tells us, there are those around who can help encourage you and lead you into that. So how can we quick start the process? So I'm going to come back to the questionnaire. There are numerous questionnaires that you can, you can use. There are, um, there are, you've got some online now. Um, that you can, you can get, there are written ones. My only comment about doing a questionnaire is it doesn't tell you what your gift is in a definitive way. It's just telling you what you think your gift might be. Because it's, as, uh, it's only as you serve with your gift that you will know what your gift is. Having it on a piece of paper doesn't, doesn't tell you what it is. This is one which I came across on, on the web called Gifted to Serve. Uh, the, uh, the, we'll put the website up again in a moment. But it gives you some instructions there on, on that page on how you can uh, use it, um, develop it, some instructions on the, on the survey itself. You can go, go back to, um, go to uh, which one will we do? Uh, do the inv gift inventory. So you've got a whole heap of questions there. Um, first one here is, uh, I'm successful at getting a group to do its work joyfully. Um, and we've got one, naught to four. Naught is uh, absolutely hopeless at it, never happens. Through to four where it's a natural thing that I do. There are 125 questions to, to answer on that. And uh, the idea is that you just do it. You don't stop and think about it. <clears throat> If you start to think about it, you probably won't give an honest answer. But your first response is probably the one closest to, to the, right, the right response. Do the whole, the whole gift uh, analysis. And then at the end you can do the tally, as it tells you there how you can do the tally up at the end of it. There's some instructions both on the lead in and how to do it and what you can do afterwards. And then as you get your gift, if we go to the definitions page, um, all those gifts are there. There is an interesting one there. It's called, um, I haven't come across it before I met this one, number five, ecbalism. Very interesting one. It's the gift of exorcism. But it has a, when you read the definition, you see that it is actually a very significant approach to it. I just put that up there as, a, as an idea. And the website that you will, um, if you Google gifted to serve, you'll come up for that. That is the, the website for it there, uh, called buildingchurch.net, right, 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 But Gifted to Serve will bring you to that, um, and to that point. Or you might find some others. If you're not on, on a computer, if you, if you can't do that, I've got uh, one or two that I could print off for you, and you can, you can have a look at that. Remember, a questionnaire will only tell you where you could start. 
If you're in a life group and you discover that you have the gift of administration, or think that you have the gift of, of, of administration, you can say to your life group leader, I think I've got the gift of administration. How can I use this within the life group? Or I have the gift of compassion. Say to your leader in the life group, how can I, how can I use a gift of compassion within our life group? Life groups are a brilliant location, a brilliant place for developing spiritual gifts. So, that's uh, some practical help, I hope, as we conclude this, um, this three-part series on our, on our spiritual gifts. And that, that as you, you do so, that God will enrich our church and, and bless us as people start to function in areas of their strength. Father, we want to thank you that as you've called us into this amazing body called the church, you have given us all a place to serve, that there isn't one of us that doesn't have a place where you want us to serve. And so we thank you for that. And as we go on a journey, perhaps, could take days, weeks, months, to really clarify this in our hearts, we pray that you will, by your Spirit, just guide us and fill us so that we might be able to function according to your plans and purposes within the church. We thank you in Jesus' name.